Aloha, talofa, and hafa day. Welcome to today's webinar, Walking Together, Fighting Human Trafficking in a Small Community. My name is Shisa Kahaunaile. I am the Outreach and Project Specialist here at the ANA Pacific Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. I will be your behind the scenes helper here and host. If you need any tech support during this webinar, please feel free to take down my email, shisa at kaananiao.com. Email me if you get kicked out and I will definitely let you back into the session. If not, you can always chat me by hovering over the bar that is located at the top of your screen um, and then chat host. Before we get into the webinar, I do wanna let you know that this webinar has sensitive topics and sensitive language. If at any time you need to remove yourself from the webinar, that is no problem at all. Take all the time you need. This webinar is being recorded and you will get a link to view it following today. Before I begin, I do want to talk about the Administration for Native Americans, which is the, um, the mother of our TTA center. They believe in supporting native-led nonprofits and eligible tribes by promoting self-sufficiency, providing funding for community-based projects and providing free training and technical assistance. Their vision is to see all native communities thriving. I wanted to hand things over to Michelle. I have, I mean, this, this is really the goal for me is to be able to do as much as she does um, and really to put natives in the forefront of your mind and of your work. And we're so honored to have you here to open up this session. Feel free to take the floor. So I am learning Mohawk. So I just tried to introduce myself <laughs> in Mohawk. Uh, for my first time publicly. So excuse me if there's anyone on this line uh, that is a native Mohawk speaker. Um, and so, uh, as I said, my name is Michelle Sauve and I uh, currently serve as the executive director for the Secretary's Interdepartmental Council on Native American Affairs at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, as she said, I kind of wear many hats. I'm also uh, the Intergovernmental Affairs Specialist at the Administration and Children and Families Helping ACF uh, with uh, tribal uh, federal uh, relationships, government to government relationships and tribal consultation. Um, while we are going through this political transition, I will also be serving temporarily as the acting commissioner of ANA. Uh, so I am delighted to uh, support this webinar uh, from ANA uh, on, to recognize uh, the issue of human trafficking. Um, January is, na is National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month, and it's an opportunity for all of us throughout the federal government to highlight this issue and promote resources uh, to end human trafficking. Um, I'm so glad that we're joined today on this webinar by uh, Catherine Chone, Director from the Office on, on Trafficking in Persons. Uh, the work we call uh, Office of Trafficking in Persons OTIP. Uh, and so the work of OTIP is vital to raising awareness, providing support, and aiding in prevention of human trafficking. Uh, Director Chown will share more in her opening remarks. Um, but I just want to relay a few of the things that ANA has been doing recently uh, to, in partnership with OTIP, um, uh, to help address um, the issue of human trafficking. Um, as Shisa mentioned, ANA has grant opportunities and the ANA Social and Economic Development Strategies, or SEDS funding, uh, focuses on community-based projects. And these can be used to address human trafficking, uh, to bring awareness, support victims uh, in both rural and urban environments, um, in the Pacific, in Alaska, and throughout the United States. Um, our funding opportunities most likely uh, will be published sometime in March. Uh, they're going through the review um, in a in clearance process right now. Um, and we do have human trafficking as a, as a program area of interest. Uh, we've also partnered uh, with OTIP over the years. Um, and most recently, uh, last year, between fall of 2019 and winter of 2020, uh, we worked with OTIP's 
NHTA Center, the National Human Trafficking Technical Assistance Center, um, and the Center for Native American Youth uh, to support eight young American Indian Alaska Native uh, cultural preservation ambassadors. Uh, we wanted to uh, work with these young leaders uh, from across the country. Um, they represented you know, both rural and urban communities, and we provided them with some in-depth training on human trafficking and challenged them to think about how they could use culture as prevention um, in their own communities, you know, whether that was on a reservation or at their college if they were a college student. Um, and so it was wonderful um, to see the, the diversity of ideas, the creativity um, that they brought to that challenge. And, and they were able to share that, um, not just with you know, Commissioner Hovland and myself and Director um, Chan, but also uh, with the Operation Lady Justice Task Force uh, that's looking at ways uh, to address missing and murdered Native Americans. Um, also, uh, we worked uh, with OTIP to help support uh, their human, their National Human Trafficking Leadership Academy. Um, the Human Trafficking Leadership Academy is a leadership development opportunity for anti-trafficking professionals and individuals with lived experience. Um, they were interested in uh, doing specific outreach to uh, Native communities uh, to bring them in for this leadership opportunity. And so we worked with them uh, for outreach um, and uh, were able to um, participate in the graduation ceremony um, recently uh, in September. And they have many amazing recommendations um, that, you know, for the federal government, um, for not just for ANA and OTIP, you know, but for the federal government wide for ways to prevent human trafficking. Um, and I know that the report was just published um, in, no, in November and it's available um, on the ACF website. Um, I have personally um, participated in a lot of uh, training, um, in-person and virtual training. Uh, and last February, um, we presented to the National Johnson O'Malley Association. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the JOM, uh, they serve, uh, they get money to serve uh, Native students in schools. Um, and so sometimes it's, you know, homework help or culture classes. They, they can do a variety of things uh, with the money that they receive in the schools, uh, but it's a good opportunity to raise the awareness of those school-based professionals, um, and, and then they can pass on that information. Um, we shared with them, uh, ANA and, and OTIP worked on a Native Youth Human Trafficking Awareness Toolkit, um, and we also shared with them information about the SOAR for Native Communities, an online course. Um, in March, uh, we also were able to deliver an in-person training to staff from over 20 different Bureau of Indian Education operated schools from across the country. Once again, you know, focusing on um, school-based professionals who are interacting with our youth um, and raising their awareness about human trafficking um, and providing them with resources that they can then implement in their schools. Um, in August, uh, ANA partnered with the Office of Tribal Government Relations in the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and we hosted a webinar uh, on two joint issues, missing and murdered Native Americans and human trafficking in Indian country, um, in order to raise awareness for veteran service providers. Uh, the presentation defined missing and murdered Native Americans and human trafficking for veteran service providers, as well as provided information on how to connect with resources and actions to address these issues in either a personal or a professional context. Um, we are always continuing to look for opportunities to partner and bring awareness of human trafficking to the Native populations that we serve. Um, so I'm very glad for, to those of you who are able to make it and join this webinar today. Um, and we look forward uh, to whatever ideas you might want to share with us as part of the Q&A. Um, or uh, reach out to me directly, uh, with what, what else we could be doing to help support you in your communities. So I now have the honor of introducing uh, direct, uh, the Director of Office of Trafficking and Persons, uh, Catherine Chone. Uh, she is a tireless advocate for human trafficking victims and survivors. 
She's also the founding director of the Office on Trafficking in Persons, uh, which once again is within the US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, she is a senior advisor on human trafficking uh, to the highest levels of HHS leadership. Uh, and uh, OTIP is responsible for developing strategies and implementing programs to prevent trafficking, uh, increase victim identification and access to services, and strengthen the health and well being of survivors. Um, OTIP also collaborates with government and non governmental partners to raise public awareness, identify research priorities, and inform policy recommendations to strengthen the nation's public health response to human trafficking. As director, Catherine leads the office and determines certification and eligibility for survivors of human trafficking. Uh, she is the federal executive officer of the National Advisory Committee on the Sex Trafficking of Children and Youth in the United States. As senior advisor, Catherine serves on multiple, multiple committees under the senior policy operating group of the President's Interagency Task Force to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. Uh, she serves on other federal related interagency working groups on violence against women, child expo exploitation, and Native American affairs. So um, I will turn it over now uh, to Catherine. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Shisa, for having uh, the Office on Trafficking in Persons participate in uh, today's webinar. As Michelle mentioned, uh, we are in the month of January, National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. And uh, during my brief time with you this morning, I wanted to spotlight the importance of um, survivor voices and um, local community-based organizations combating human trafficking and um, uh, doing the hard work of preventing both the perpetration of human trafficking as well as victimization. I want to start with a um, story um, from one of the first survivors of trafficking I met um, uh, who uh, and this was nearly 20 years ago uh, working in a, uh, as I was working in a victim service organization in Washington, DC, um, one of the young women um, I came to know, she was uh, trafficked in illicit, um, the illicit massage industry in multiple states across the country, um, including in Hawaii and um, some of the other Pacific islands. And I still remember to this day, um, she mentioned how as she was being transported across um, state lines that some of the hardest conditions for her uh, were in um, geographically in island communities because not only was, did she feel isolated wherever she went, um, but she felt the um, degree of physical isolation um, in, um, uh, in the various island communities she uh, the traffickers brought her to. And I mean, the bright side of her story is that um, after she was able to leave her trafficking situation, she returned to pursue her training as a nurse and um, currently is a nurse working somewhere in the United States and um, having a full thriving life. Um, but I, I um, kept reflecting on um, some of the stories that she shared with me from um, uh, the various conditions uh, she was exposed to uh, when she experienced human trafficking. And in mid-2019, I had the opportunity uh, to go along with uh, the Administration for Native Americans uh, to visit Hawaii and uh, CNMI and Guam um, to have a better in-person understanding of what local communities and um, survivors of trafficking were uh, facing when it came to both labor trafficking and sex trafficking. And uh, much had not changed over the course of 20 years. We heard of um, stories of forced labor in the fishing industry, in farming and agriculture. We heard stories of um, sex trafficking and increasing concerns of um, online exploitation and grooming and recruitment as more um, young people were going online, especially in the context of the pandemic um, this past year. And also um, uh, more recruitment for jobs moving online as well. 
And uh, one of the strongest messages um, I heard, um, in addition to all the stories of hope and resilience and um, the strength of community from local uh, community-based organizations and faith-based organizations working on these issues every single day um, was a one in part a sense of interconnection that although this month we're focusing on uh, spotlighting the violence, the commercialized violence of human trafficking, uh, communities across the country, including in the Pacific, uh, recognize that human trafficking doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, there are historical legacies of violence, intergenerational trauma um, that impact how human trafficking is experienced today, who it victimizes, um, the ease of um, getting away with the crime, and, um, and the need for uh, short and long-term support for survivors, uh, especially in the areas of housing and economic stability. Um, but then these issues are connected to so many other forms of violence, uh, whether it's child maltreatment, intimate partner violence, other forms of community violence, that no one agency can address human trafficking alone. And even at the federal level, at the Office on Trafficking in Persons, uh, we're a very passionate group of people uh, working to um, put out federal funding for victim services, uh, working through partnerships to um, strengthen prevention on human trafficking, to strengthen research and data, and have a clearer understanding of um, how the evolving trends around human trafficking victimization and perpetration and what we can do to continue to make progress in this area. Uh, but just as the criminal forces around human trafficking are interconnected, uh, uh, I experienced and witnessed the, um, again, going back to the resiliency of local communities where it's not just the um, local anti-trafficking organization, but sometimes that anti-trafficking organization um, may not have the luxury to just focus on human trafficking and is working at a broader uh, violence prevention perspective, or um, there may be organizations that may not even see themselves as working to address trafficking, but are addressing other root causes, uh, such as uh, the need for more youth mentors um, to reduce um, uh, community violence, improve um, health and well being outcomes, and uh, strengthening families, uh, providing economic pathways for those who've been um, historically underserved. And uh, one of the uh, main points that I would like to um, uh, bring, especially as we're at this transition point within the federal government is that human trafficking is impacted by many root causes, um, but including um, racial equity. And just yesterday, uh, the president signed an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the, throughout the federal government and um, recognizing that uh, we need to take a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, including those who've experienced trafficking, those are at, who are at disproportionate risk for human trafficking. And um, as we look ahead to what our collaborations can look like, certainly between the Office on Trafficking in Persons and the Administration for Native Americans and other federal partners, uh, we want you to know that we have an open door for um, those on the call today um, who are in uh, locations that seem or that are actually physically very far and distant uh, from Washington, D.C., um, but that is one of the reasons why we've been making a very concerted effort with the Administration for Native Americans uh, to reduce that feeling of distance and disconnection and strengthen communication, um, open new doors for partnerships and collaboration. So on this call, I invite you to join us as we continue to strengthen um, uh, these efforts. And also just highlighting some recent resources um, Michelle gave a um, summary of some of the collaborations we've had with the Administration for Native Americans. Some others I wanted to put out to you and we'll um, add, add some of these into the um, chat function as well. 
is that when we heard from um, tribal leaders and um, organizations serving Native communities, that would be really helpful to have a um, training program on human trafficking specifically uh, for Native communities. We created a um, separate module uh, on our SORTA Health and Wellness Training Program, which is a nationally accredited training program on human trafficking for health and human service providers. And this module um, is, uh, builds on the other elements of the SORTA Health and Wellness Training, but also um, specifically adds um, some of the uh, cultural factors uh, for consideration in serving survivors of trafficking and those at risk for trafficking in Native communities. Um, the other thing I would want to mention is that for the first time last year, uh, we awarded a new grant program uh, to provide comprehensive victim services uh, for um, survivors of human trafficking in Native communities. Um, so now we have uh, programs to serve foreign national victims, domestic victims, and then also um, strengthening the cultural competencies to support um, native survivors of trafficking and those at risk. And then finally, um, uh, Michelle had mentioned some of the work that we've been doing with native youth. And I wanted to end on a note of prevention because we are in prevention month. Um, there is a lot we can do um, with elevating the stories of survivors, elevating the stories of um, youth, um, as well as ideas for change. And um, uh, last year, we also uh, uh, established the very first national grant program for human trafficking prevention education. And uh, later this month in the coming year, we are looking specifically for collaborations with local organizations, uh, local leadership and survivors on what we could do to uh, better target prevention efforts, again, preventing victimization as well as perpetration. So. Um, our main call to action is please know that we're here as a resource for you in Washington, DC. There are many online resources that you can take advantage of. Uh, we're an open door and please reach out if any of these um, opportunities um, seem like good points of collaboration for you. And if there are any other ways that we can help build uh, capacity and leadership in your local communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I We really are so lucky to have had uh, Michelle and Catherine on this webinar. It is amazing the work that has been done to combat human trafficking. And just like she said, there are so many roots of causes when it comes to trafficking. And um, the point of this webinar really is to get this into our Native communities so that we can work together um, from the outside, from the inside out to make sure that we're addressing what needs to be addressed in our communities first so that we can help the overall um, you know, roots that are, that are affecting so many people. Um, with that being said, I do want to take the time to introduce Veronica Lam, who is a victim specialist at Susanna Wesley Community Center here on the island of Oahu. She provides comprehensive case management to victims of, hum of human trafficking statewide here in Hawaii. Uh, she is also the social justice director for Blue, Mo for Blue Water Mission, and she's mentored over 100 human trafficking survivors, male, female, adult, and adolescents. Um, she's lived in and directed one of the only trafficking safe homes on Oahu, and we're so lucky. She is a mother. She is a hard worker. She is giving you know, her time to talk about human trafficking and how it affects us here in Hawaii and so many other Native communities around um, all four of our regions around America. And I just want to give you the floor, Veronica. Hey, hi. Today we're going to be doing a um, CSEC training. I'm Veronica Lamb from Hawaii. And I'll be sharing with you guys about commercial sexual exploitation of children. So like I said, my name is Veronica Lamb. Everybody calls me Vern um, that knows me here. 
Um, my background, just a bit of it, I've been a mentor to over 100 human trafficking survivors, and that includes males, females, adult, and adolescents, um, labor trafficking victims, international victims, domestic victims, uh, sex trafficking versus labor, everybody. Um, I lived in and directed one of the only trafficking safe homes that we have here on Oahu, and I'm the social justice director for Blue Water Mission. I'm also a victim specialist with Susanna Wesley Community Center. And Susanna Wesley Community Center, we have a trafficking victims assistance program, and that provides comprehensive case management to victims um, of human trafficking. So again, labor, sex, minors, adults, um, statewide. We provide um, services for, for victims. I do always have to give this disclaimer since we are talking about sex trafficking and we're going to be representing, I'll be sharing with you some survivor voices, um, some of their direct statements in this training. So it can be graphic and it can be disturbing. There is some, what some may consider inappropriate language or foul language. Um, in some of the statements, but I think it's important for us to be able to hear what it is that these survivors are saying. And so I'll be sharing that with you. If you need to take care of yourself, like take a break, take a breather, I totally understand. Um, do take care of yourself. And for those of you that um, can engage in this, convers in this conversation, in this uh, training, please do. So we'll start off by defining commercial sexual exploitation of children and trafficking. Um, they overlap quite a bit. And what I'm going to talk about is the federal definition here. So the Trafficking Victims Protection Act went into effect in the year 2000. So we've had 20 years of this in the United States. Um, and that has been revised over time. What you need to know in this definition is how they define sex trafficking and labor trafficking. So sex trafficking, in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion. Okay, those are important words there, force, fraud, or coercion. It doesn't mean that all of those have to, exi have to exist. So even in an adult victim, there could simply be coercion for it to meet the federal definition. Okay, there doesn't have to be fraud. There doesn't have to be chains. They don't have to be bound up. Um, there doesn't have to be fraud or there could only be fraud. There could be any of these things, right? Any of this mix here. Then the second part of the sex trafficking definition um, is really important. It says, or in which the person induced to perform such act has not attained 18 years of age. So what that means is that anyone who is not an adult, any minor, and they are participating in any commercial sex act where there is something of value in exchange for the sex, for the sexual act, that would classify as trafficking. There doesn't have to be force, fraud, or coercion for the minors. So. A situation could be a 16-year-old that says they are willingly doing pornography or stripping or, um, yeah, sex video chatting, any of that kind of stuff. If they're a minor and they're exchanging sex for something of value, even if it's their basic needs, that's still a part of sex trafficking. And then there's also labor trafficking, and that would be recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision or obtaining of a person for labor or services. And again, we have force, fraud, or coercion in there, and they are subjected to involuntary servitude, teenage debt bondage, or slavery. And if you guys have um, questions, we're gonna have a Q and A. Um, so next, I wanna talk about the types of trafficking. This is what we have in Hawaii, but I think it's also what you are likely to see in your communities. As we look around the world and we network, and we collaborate with more partners, we see that unfortunately, trafficking has um, some very similar methodologies across the world and across different communities. So we'll go over these um, with you guys. I'm gonna break them down each just as we're on this slide. So labor trafficking, we have labor trafficking in Hawaii, 
um, your area may have it also. Our typical areas that we see in labor trafficking include construction and include farming, but also include the fishing industry, particularly the long line fishing industry. Um, we have international docks, so it's considered international waters and therefore not easily within the jurisdiction of like our local law enforcement to be able to check what's going on. Um, we've also seen labor trafficking in maybe businesses that some people don't expect, such as restaurants. We've even had them in um, accounting offices. Um, we've certainly had them uh, in domestic servitude-like situations or caregiving where they are taking care of an elderly patient, they are taking care of a younger patient or a client that they are taking care of, but it becomes a labor trafficking situation because they are um, required to work around the clock. They're not allowed to talk to other people. They may not be allowed to um, come into the kitchen to eat their own food or cook their own food. We've had situations where they had to cook outside, like on a grill and use a, um, uh, a laundry sink, an outdoor sink, in order to wash their dishes or to get water for their food, that kind of thing. Then I'm gonna go into different types of sex trafficking that we have. Um, familial trafficking is one that is often most disturbing to local communities when they, when they realize that that does exist in their um, area. That's where a family member or a caretaker, a person in control of the minor um, we have non-formal adoption uh, community practices here in Hawaii, uh, where we would call it Hanai, like a Hanai family. And so it can be any range of that, you know, of somebody who formally has control of the minor or somebody that um, is the adult in the situation or is the older person in the situation taking care of that minor. And they start trading out the minor or some other good or something else of value. Um, oftentimes what we see is that this is where we find our youngest victims. This is also where we find um, boys that have been sex trafficked and they identify as straight. They often identify as familial trafficking as the beginning of their trafficking and sometimes the current form of trafficking that they've been experiencing. Um, Next, I'll talk about survival and recreational. So this one is, I think, a little controversial. There's a lot of um, nonprofits or people between law enforcement and nonprofit world that refer to survival sex in regards to children, or there are a lot of um, statements from society or the community that says that children just want to trade sex in order to get what it is that they want. What I would say that we've seen in our program is that we have seen some kids who do want something who know that their family is not able to provide it for them and they buy into the glitz and glamour of what's being sold by society the over sexualization and they think that they can just you know turn a trick do a date and they'll be able to get whatever it is you know two hundred dollars um two hundred and fifty dollars to buy the purse or the prom dress or you know the new item whatever it is that they want um, and then we do have um, some kids who are out on the run and they do have survival needs and they will trade sex uh, in order to be able to meet those needs but when we look at this we look at it and what i see um, is consumer-based trafficking there are consumers adults with access to money who are taking advantage of these children. And so we feel that it is not fair to put the blame solely on the child. Most of the blame should be on the adults that are taking advantage of these kids. And we should refer to it as what it is, as trafficking. And it's a, a consumer-based uh, form of trafficking. And also for these kids that are, or young adults that are, naive that don't necessarily know what exactly it is that they're doing. They don't know the workings of the sex industry. It's very easy for traffickers and for um, perpetrators, um, violent customers, any of them to recognize 
by the ads or the posts that the kids are putting out there that they are naive, that they are immature, that they don't know what they're doing, that they are young, and that they can easily be taken advantage of. So even if they start out by making a choice and saying like, hey, I want to trade sex for something of value, that choice gets dwindled away from them very, very, very quickly. Um, we've even had uh, pimps and traffickers show up pretending to be customers to the dates and then taking control and basically kidnapping the minor. Next, let's talk about gang control. Gang control is something that we see out here in Hawaii. I think every community um, or many communities in the United States tend to see that. You know, gangs all over the country and all over the world have learned that you can um, you're less likely to go to jail for trafficking an individual than you are for selling drugs. You know, drugs are the evidence. If you got it on hand, then it's a pretty like open and shut easy case, right? If you've got a victim that's afraid to testify, that is in love with the perpetrator, that is confused, that thinks that it's all their fault, um, that doesn't know where the blame begins and ends in the relationship, then they're less likely to talk to law enforcement. And without a victim, they're often, without a willing victim who is going to talk about what happened, there often isn't a case. So we do have gang control. One thing that we have seen, and you may be seeing it in your area, it's something to pay attention to, it's easy to miss, but we have noticed that gangs have started, instead of jumping in members, they are sexting in members. And that can be females and males. And they are forced to have sex with every member of the gang. And this is complicated because there's the existing gang members that may have got brought in when it was just a fight, when it was just being jumped in, now are forced to participate in this initiation of raping another male or another female. And that creates a lot of guilt, a lot of mixed feelings, a lot of sense of like, I can't get out of this. It, it just um, strengthens the power of the gang and the harm in which the gang is doing to the new victims coming in as well as the current members, um, particularly when the child, when the children are very young adults. Um, next one that I'll talk about is queen moms. So queen moms, queen moms in general is a term that is at least used here in Hawaii and we've heard it used other places in the mainland also, uh, where in the trans population, particularly in the male to female trans, um, that the there's an older female that is looked up at. And that just means that they have, that older female is at least well into puberty, if not an adult. And it could be just an older teenager. Um, but they are looked up to and they take a younger individual under their wing just to mentor and to encourage them and to guide them along the way, provide support, that kind of stuff that maybe the, ch the child isn't getting at home. This can turn into some queen moms take advantage of the younger trans kids and the vulnerabilities that they're in and they literally turn into pimps and traffickers where they start requiring them, they say, oh, you can stay with me. So they've built this false relationship of leading the child or the young adult to believe, to think that this person cares about them. But instead they start saying like, well, you know, I need you to help out with rent. I need you to help out with food. I need you to help out, you know, because I'm buying the alcohol or I'm buying the weed, whatever the situation may be. And they start manipulating the kid and saying like, hey, you know, this is how you really learn to walk. This is how you really learn to do your makeup. This is how you really learn to be a woman and tell them and teach them and mentor them onto the street and trafficking them. And then we've seen it to turn into full on situations where there's a quota required every day. There's punishments if that money isn't met. Um, and they also typically turn them into recruiters by using misinformation also with them and saying like, oh, well, you can't get your hormones unless you can pay for it. You need to save up money. If only we had other um, girls here or boys here working with us, then that could help share the expenses and you would be able to save more money for your hormones, right? So they're using that fear about puberty and how their body's gonna change against them. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a false form of mentorship and it really 
preys on those more vulnerable trans kids. And then we also see that typical pimps, a lot of them will also pimp out the trans kids or the straight boys or any of them. Um, they will pimp out because they just see it as money. Um, last one that I'll talk about is pimp controlled or pimp and drug controlled. So pimp controlled is probably what most people think of when they think about prostitution in America. They think about like a pimp controlling it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that it's often a situation where the pimp is taking all of the money. Like that is the rules of the game that are established. There's a lot of different rules in the game um, that they have. And um, then we have pimp and drug control. So if you have a victim that comes off the street that's very heavily um, drug control to where it is noticeable. It is visibly noticeable that they have drug addictions and it's affecting their appearance, it's affecting their behavior, everything like that. But they also have the boyfriend, the daddy, the pimp. You need to assume that the pimp is also, um, also has a drug addiction because they are um, not in, in the pimp world, they're not managing their victim, they're not managing their product um, in a way to keep them from being completely overtaken by the drug, like they're letting the drug control more than what they control. So in that kind of a situation, what we've seen is they're more interested in getting money than they are in the health and welfare or the longevity of that person, of that child or adult. And so they will often be advertising that person as willing to do sex without condoms. Um, they call it bareback or boyfriend, girlfriend um, experience, that kind of thing. And so those kinds of victims, you really need to be concerned about their health and welfare and um, try and help them get to STD checks and see if they need medication because it's a very uh, dangerous situation uh, for them. So the main part of what I wanted to discuss with you guys today is some focus groups that myself and Dr. Shante Williams did here in Hawaii. And we wanted to hear from the youth. And so our focus groups was, fo was focused on youth and young adults at high risk for commercial sexual exploitation of children. So it's likely to be in their background or um, something that they have current recently experienced. And we ask questions about their childhood background, trying to understand what's going on behind the scenes and in the history, what the push and the pull factors were, and what their current perspective was um, as youth or as young adults. Our methods, we did a written survey with the youth. We also did an ACEs survey and we did a short group discussion with each of the focus groups. We went to several facilities that we have here in Hawaii on Oahu. And we looked at DH is what we commonly call it. Um, it's a short for detention home, but its real name is Kapolei Juvenile Detention Facility. So that is a youth facility, not an adult facility. It is secured, so it is locked and it is short term. We went to HYCF, that is the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility that's over in Kailua uh, on the windward side of our island. Again, they focus on youth up to age 19. So there can be an 18 year old there, but uh, once they turn 19, they have to move on. That is secured also completely under lock and key and it is a long-term correctional facility. So the children, the youth could stay there for months or years at a time. Um, we then went to the Holly Kipa CSAC Assessment Center that's known as Holly Lani Pula, uh, Pulua, sorry. Um, that also services youth um, under the age of 19. It is not locked, okay? So they have, they don't lock their doors. It is short term and it does have a CSEC focus. Um, or the, the youth all have a background of CSEC that come in there. And then there's the RISE facility. So that's the Residential Youth Services and Empowerment um, group. They do adults. They do 18 to 24, so young adults. It is more like a drop-in, and it could be a long-term um, placement for some of them, but their focus is homelessness. So those young adults that have transitioned 
a lot of them have transitioned out of care, coming out of difficult situations, and they haven't quite found their way and just providing a resource for them. So those are the types of facilities that we looked at. Part of why I'm sharing this with everybody is because this may be something that you wanna look into in your own community. See if you can do some focus groups and talk with some of the youth in the facilities um, in your community and understand more what's going on with them. So sharing here what we learned in our study, who we talked to, the demographics. Um, there was 28 males. There was 15 females, and that includes one trans individual. There was one person that left it blank. So we had a total of 44 participants. Um, as far as their ages, two were between the ages of 13 and 14, um, quite young. Two participants were over the age of 19. Everybody else was between the ages of 15 and 18. So I'll start off by talking about our ACE scores, and these are adverse childhood experiences. If you haven't heard about it, um, Google it. It's kind of a, a standardized set of questions um, that have been asked. So we were able to do this not only with the youth, we were able to give this to 40 of the youth, but we were also able to give it to seven staff members in these different facilities. And the scores changed, you know, anywhere from zero to 10. If you just took a straight average, five would be the average score. But what's really important is that a majority, almost everyone had scores of three or higher. And those that scored a zero, as far as the youth either did not complete their forms or are already known to us and they just fudge their forms. Um, we know that they have higher scores and just um, higher incidents in their childhoods. Um, so some of them refused to complete, and then some of them just avoided certain questions. So here's a chart showing the ACE scores here, and the youth is the light blue, and the dark blue is the staff. And I think what's really interesting is to note here that not only most of the youth score above three, but almost all of the staff also score above three. You can also see that we had a very high number of youth that scored nine ACEs, nine adverse childhood experiences. And if you look at some of these studies, this indicates a lot about the future of not only their physical health, but their mental and relational health um, and how tough it will be if not treated. So we went in and we used the written questions a lot and then some of the discussion to talk about their childhood and relationships. So here's their relationship scores. You can see that they rated here on a scale from very good, which is on the far left, to the very bad on the far right. And they rated for family, which is in red, friends in purple, and blue for their partner. And one of the interesting quotes from an individual was, trust no one. And 20 of the youth, I said an individual, but actually 20 of the 41 youth surveyed, so nearly half of them, um, wrote a statement or verbalized a statement to us, um, basically along these lines, trust no one. Now, if you looked at that chart carefully, you may realize that's very contradictory to their scores because almost all of them rated everything good, very good, on the positive side of the scale. So we pulled out some additional quotes from the children, from the youth, and what they had to say. Here's one. I told my mom I was hungry and asked for food. She told me it isn't her problem. And that's when I began to steal. Another one. It's hard to stay clean when the drugs are in your house. My dad's parents would tell me not to use while I'm looking at them smoking out of a pipe. Next one, I was born into a gang. Some people are born into rich families. Some people are born into gangs. This is what I got. And what we noticed from them and talking to them, they 26% of them indicated that they previously tried to get help, but did not receive it. And I think that this is really important as you know, community members, um, as those that care about our community, as service providers, um, 
this is an important statistic for us to realize. Next, we talk to them about drugs and gangs. So looking at drugs, you know, asking them what's their preferred um, type of drugs, we got a um, wide variety here. Um, not really surprising um, for Hawaii what the main ones were. Um, but we were surprised by some of their quotes, like some of the statements that they had to say. And Hawaii is a very diverse um, population with people from a lot of different backgrounds, um, many people born here, many people not born here from other areas. And so it was just very interesting to hear from them. So I'll share some of this quote with you. Weed is a gateway drug. I started with weed, then dabs, then meth, and heroin. And that was one of our male participants. And just to highlight, we did this um, focus group in the spring of 2019. Um, some other things that we saw here, marijuana was their number one choice of drugs amongst the youth surveyed, and 32% of them said that that was their preferred. Um, meth came in second at 24%, and that was closely followed by alcohol. There was only one participant that stated that they don't use drugs. Of the so paying for drugs, this is always uh, a thing to find out. Um, from youth. So we'll start with one of the quotes from a female participant. She quoted Cardi B. She said, fuck it, then I get some money. That's how she looked at how she paid for drugs and got it. So if we're talking about exchanging sex for something of value, drugs is considered something of value. So we asked them how they got those drugs. Um, six of them said that they got it they admitted to getting it from sex and or game rooms. So game rooms, you guys have them. We have them. It's just places where there's illegal gambling. So they're illegal um, set up shops in the back of businesses or, you know, some dive place, um, homes it could be in. But six of the six of the youth um, reported that. Um, three of them said that they used their family to be able to pay for the drugs. Um, four reported robbery and theft. That's how they get the money to pay for their drugs. Two of them said that they got them from their friends. Four said that they do work or they do chores. And then two of them said that they just sell drugs to get money for their own drugs. And regarding gangs, several youth spoke of being born into the gang or the gang being their family. One of them, or it's not just one of them, but they talked about being blessed into it was another phrase that was used by the youth to describe being chosen into gangs. And we noticed that the similar language of chosen being used in both the gang life and in the sexual exploitation. And we'll share more uh, about the sexual exploitation um, questions and feedback that we got from them. But this idea of somebody choosing them seemed very important to the youth. And I think that we can use that as key information when we look at um, how we relate, how we talk to, and how we invite youth to be a part of programs and um, activities that are healthy for them. So let's jump into the CSEC side of this. Um, so the youth responses, six of the youth um, disclosed on the survey that they had um, been in a situation where they had traded sex for something. Three of them denied it, but um, because we're on an island, we also knew a lot of individuals. And so we knew that they were confirmed victims. Um, and so it came out to nine out of the 41 youth that we talked to um, were confirmed victims of, were disclosed or confirmed victims of trafficking. So looking at the recruitment tactics, like how does this happen, right? That's what everybody in society wants to know. Even if you've been in um, as a service provider for a while, you've even been in this arena of trafficking, every new client we're looking at, like what happened in their story, right? So talking to the youth individuals, this is what they had to say. Traffickers manipulate you when you're at your lowest. 
they make deals. Like if you find me this girl, then you get half the price that I give her. Next quote. Because the people got to do what they got to do. Poor broke need money, so they hustle. One here said, tricking girls who need love. And another one, money moves smooth and bitches and hoe be working on the corner. So this is interesting because it shows the mindset of the youth that are in particularly high risk situations um, and what they think about the recruitment into trafficking, into um, exchanging sex acts for something of, um, of value. Now we also questioned the staff to see if they thought CSEC was a problem. If they thought the, what percentage of youth in their programs had been involved in CSEC. And it was interesting, you know, it was the majorities are complete opposite. So, you know, almost 32% of the people think that 75% of the kids, like 75% or more, almost all of them have had CSEC involvement. And then on the other side of that, we've got 26.3 say that, oh, none of them have, or maybe only 15% have had any involvement. And then we look down and we can see that there's others that are saying, well, maybe it's 50%, it's around the 50% mark. But that was really interesting to see what the staff thought and how prevalent they thought it was versus what the youth actually disclosed. Next, we looked at reasons to run. We talked to them about that. I ran away from my problems and to hide my crying in pain. I wonder why I still didn't figure it out. That was one of our focus group participants, a female participant. So when they're running from home, there's different situations depending on where they're home. So we broke it out to like home. Um, how many of them were running from something that would fall into that category of running from. Um, 12 of them reported that they were running from physical, sexual, emotional abuse, or neglect. Um, running to something. So seven of them reported that they ran because of friends, like there was peer pressure, they had a significant other that they wanted to be with. Nine of them reported that they wanted to party or they wanted to have access to drugs. And two of them reported running from placement back to family. So they are running back to their family to get back to it. Two of the youth reported that they were kicked out of their homes and two of the youth left because they were fearful people from the streets would harm their families. They're afraid that if they stayed with their family, they would draw or attract the bad elements from the street, they would come and retaliate and hurt their family members. So this gives a, a good picture into like, what's going on with the kids? Why are they doing what they're doing? Now we also talked to them about running from programs, running from residential treatment. The top ones that they mentioned, we listened, we list, we listened to them and then we listed it here. So it was peer pressure, it was boredom in the programs. They were wanting to be back with family. Many of them loved their family very much. Um, some reported missing friends or missing their boyfriends, missing their girlfriends. They want to get back to them. Um, it was, I was kind of surprised by this, but there was a number of them that said that they didn't want their friends to be alone on the streets. So if they heard that their friend ran, their friend was out, they felt like that they didn't need to go out and be with them, that it would be safer for them and they would feel bad if that person was out there by themselves. They also mentioned being triggered by peers. They mentioned wanting to look good, getting their hair and nails done, wanting to go out, wanting to party. And then they also mentioned not getting along with other residents and some of the strife and conflict that comes up in programs or services. So finally, the final category that we talked to them about was um, hope and future. So the most common theme and what we asked them was like, what gives you hope for your future? What makes you want to live towards the future? That was the, the kind of questions that we were asking. So the most common theme by far was family. You know, they had hope of either reuniting with 
their family, they had hopes of having a family in the future, something like that. This one kind of surprised me, but religion, God and church was mentioned frequently, 13% of them um, mentioned that that's what gives them strength, that's what gives them hope and looking towards the future and keeps them going. Um, they said going to school or going to work, so it's like that feeling of like accomplishing something. Um, they said being sober and working on their addiction, that was really important to them for their hope and for their future. Um, they mentioned a stable home and specifically mentioned trust something that was honest and straightforward, an environment with that. And here's a quote from one of our group participants, a safe home that is not doing any drugs and that they are safe to live with. It's the main things that the kids want, you know? And I think that's important for us to understand that that desire is there in their hearts. So a little bit on the staff surveys and then I'll wrap this up for you guys. Um, 15 out of the 19 staff surveyed said that they wanted more training on CSEC. Um, the staff identified mental health and sex trafficking um, as an increased uh, frequency and increased issue that they're seeing in the youth and that those were areas that they were needing more training on. Um, Policies regarding client background information often make it difficult for staff to fully understand the youth. So they expressed some concerns of that they didn't feel like they were getting enough of the full picture of what the background was of that youth so that they could properly support that youth. Um, some of our recommendations that we made here in Hawaii, and we would also you know, just offer up as a suggestion for you to think about and see if it applies in your area, in your program, um, in your community. So looking at youth services, always debrief with, with a youth um, when they return from being on the run. Ask where they were and with who the youth was with. Okay, that's important. Um, assess for CSEP for each youth in your care at intake and then also following each run because any run, even if they're only out there for 12, 24 hours, just short periods of time, really bad things can happen, you know, and there's um, um, predators that are looking to prey upon them. Um, we suggest providing structure and activity to fill the days, not too much like downtime because of that boredom that they feel. Um, and it shouldn't be, the youth said this, they didn't want all arts and crafts. <laughs> they wanted some outings. They wanted to get out in nature. They wanted to do some things that were separate from the facility, um, particularly the residential ones that they were staying in. Um, they wanted skills training. One of the suggestions that we made was like braiding on mannequin heads, like something where it's not triggering to each other but just where they could be practicing and they could be learning a skill. And then having a career day, they really love seeing, they express this, they really love seeing people with different careers, um, different things that they can think about and envision and um, wonder if that's a possibility for themselves and start dreaming. It just increases their ability to dream and think of the options in the um, we always suggest uh, controls or limitations on internet usage. Um, we also are fans of structure, you know, chores, responsibilities, a schedule, things like that, that they can count on, that they can feel like they're accomplishing, that they can feel like that they're moving forward on. Um, whenever possible and safe, include the youth's family or guardian. And again, that's if they're safe, not part of the familial trafficking. Um, or those that they care about. So that could be like a co-parent. You know, that could be, you know, the, the father or mother of their child. Um, they would like those individuals also involved in decisions. So assess if it's safe and where possible um, and safe, then try to work that in. Provide youth with choices when possible. Like, can they earn something like going to bed at a later time or other treats or other incentives, that kind of stuff, giving them something to strive for. Um, for staff support. So, you know, working in this field, I've been in this field for over 12 years now. Um, it's a really, you know, it's a hard field to be in and we need to support each other. And if you're part of an organization, you want to support your coworkers and 
if you're running an organization or managing it, you want to look at how you can support the staff under you. So some of the suggestions that we made here in Hawaii was ensure the community and other service providers know and understand your program's goals and outcome measures. So that way others understand what it is that you're doing and why it is that you're doing it. Um, policies and procedures for intake to include client background information where appropriate. Um, equip staff to be good listeners and understand the language of the kids. The kids really appreciated us coming in just to talk to them. Um, for staff support, we would also suggest understand the difference between rapport building and poor boundaries and empathy. So that may be something that the staff have to work through, especially if your staff is typical. Apparently our staff have high ACEs also. Um, uh, that's important for that support to be around them um, and helping them define boundaries and empathy and what's appropriate rapport building and that kind of stuff. Provide debrief sessions for staff, like clarify when to follow up, when the follow up actions will occur, will occur. So they understand what's going on, they have a chance to process it. Um, provide quarterly training on various topics seen amongst the population. So this ties into staff requesting more training on substance abuse, on trauma, on psychotropic med medications, um, you know, on CSEC, of course, a lot of staff were looking for. Um, evaluate the structure of your facility. Would restructuring allow for better success for your clients? Um, utilize and or implement self-care or mental health days. And, you know, a lot of these points, it applies to all of us. So whether we're case managers, whether we're volunteers, whether we're staff, you know, we care about our communities. If we're dealing with hard issues inside our communities and inside our youth, particularly around the trafficking topic, um, we got to take care of ourselves. Um, Evaluate current staff scheduling to decrease burnout and policy and procedure regarding client histories, ensuring no retaliation or breach of confidentiality. So it's weighing that, you know, people want to know what's going on so that they can be trauma informed, but then also really respecting confidentiality and making sure there's no retaliation of like giving somebody an excuse to think worse of someone. Um, we, of course, re highly recommend commercial, you know, trainings on CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation of children, and um, particularly looking at recruitment and the victim to victimizer phase, victim to victimizer phases in um, the trauma journey. Um, look at mental health, substance abuse, trauma and trigger reactions. Um, anger management and conflict resolution, and then residential staff best practices if you're in a residential area. So this is my contact information. Like I said, Dr. Shante Williams and myself, Veronica Lamb, um, we did these focus groups. We would actually love to hear from you guys. You guys can take a picture, particularly of my email address if you're interested in the questions that we use. To be able to gather this information from the youth, you can email me. I would love to hear, would love to hear. If you go out and start talking to um, youth in your area and are able to ask them, you know, the questions that we're asking or you develop your own questions, we would love to be able to hear about that. You can sanitize the um, results and then we would be able to, if you are willing to like send it to us and then we would be willing to like compile that together and get an even like broader picture. I think that would be amazing for our collaboration. But I just wanna thank you guys for your time. Thank you for sticking with this um, presentation, for talking about hard things and for doing all the work that you're doing in your communities. Aloha. I do want to mention that we don't actually have time to do a Q&A, but I did want to thank Veronica for that very in-depth presentation. Um, I'm, especially, I'm especially excited because there was a portion about how to support your staff. And I know that that is something, especially now um, in the position that we're all in, <laughs> most of us, if not all, have been working from home. And even more so being able to support those around you as you help and support human trafficking and the victims and survivors. 
it's really important that we support each other through, through this time. We will be taking questions via email. You can email me at shisa.kananiel.com and I can connect you with Veronica or Michelle or Catherine at, um, you know, depending on what the question is. This will be, this is a recorded session and it will be going out to you via email. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and of your week.